um, I'm going to preach, preach tonight on Lot. Now, he's a, we're familiar with the story a lot. Um, uh, we, we know that, uh, he, we know he, and we'll see this in the Bible tonight, he, he's, the Bible calls him a just man, meaning he was saved. He was a believer. And yet, boy, I tell you what, he's, he's one of those cases where probably, I wonder if Abraham didn't have some questions whether Lot was really saved or not. You know, you could because you look at you look at what's going on in his life, and, and so forth, and, and and you could wonder. But the Bible is very clear; he was a saved man. So how did he mess up so badly? And it wasn't just himself. You know that you know how some people you've heard somebody say this. Well, listen, it's just I'm not doing anything that's going to affect anybody else. This is just me, and and I and we know, folks. <laughs> uh, listen. Every single one of them. No man lives to himself and no man dies to himself. Our lives all touch other lives. We have an impact. We're going to see that uh, tonight. But why, what was the, what happened? What happened? And how can we avoid what happened in Lot's life? You know, uh, we've heard this, it's a common thing you hear sometimes still today, you know, don't be that guy, (laughs) you know. Yeah, don't be that guy. Don't be the Christian who who uh, who who who's ends up all their influence is to the negative side of the spectrum. Oh, did he go to heaven? Yeah, I don't think he's as happy in heaven as he as he wanted to be. I'm sure for a lot there were some real tears. He experienced some real loss and stuff. So let's we'll, we'll look at that. But if you'd look in your Bibles here. Um, A couple of places in the scripture. Luke chapter 17, verse 28. Jesus spoke about Lot. He said in Luke 17, 28, Likewise also as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day... Uh, He which shall be on the housetop and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. He that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. Remember Lot's wife. Whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life uh, shall preserve it. You know, of course, Jesus, he's talking about the the last of the perilous last days here. And and boy, don't we know the Lord's return is is just imminent. And so forth. Now look at another passage of Scripture, Genesis 19, verse 29. Just a little bit of review of the tail end of the story of Lot, and then we'll look at some other things. Genesis 19, verse 29 says this, And it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in in the which Lot dwelt. And Lot went up uh, out of Zor and dwelt in the mountain and his two daughters with him, for he feared to dwell in Zor, and he dwelt in a cave, he and his two daughters. And the firstborn said unto the younger, Our father is old, and there is not a man in the earth to come in unto us after the manner of all the earth. Come, let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him that we may preserve seed of our father. And they made their father drink wine that night, and the firstborn went in and lay with her father, and he perceived not when she lay down, nor, well, nor when she arose. And it came to pass on the morrow that the firstborn said to the younger, Behold, I lay yesternight with my father. Let us make him drink wine this night also, and go, in th- and go thou in and lie with him, that we may preserve seed Uh, of our father, and they made their father drink wine that night also, and the younger arose and lay with him, and he perceived not when she lay down, nor when she arose. Thus were both the daughters of Lot with child by their father. And the firstborn bare a son and called his name Moab. The same is the father of the Moabites unto this day. And the younger, she also bare a son called his name Ben-Ami. The same is the father of the children of Ammon unto this day. Let's pray. Father, please help us tonight. I pray that 
you'd stir us with your word. Lord, there's times when we need to hear an admonition from you, a warning. And, and, and Lord, we, we live in what could only be described as a, in our country, a spiritually dead time, a, a time when Christians seem to be asleep. Uh, Lord, I pray that you'd stir us up and, and awaken us and help us not to make the same sinful mistakes that Lot made. And it led to the destruction of his whole family. Lord, there was so much uh, uh, um, uh, damage done by the fact that, uh, by the way he did not live for you. So Lord, please uh, stir us with your word. Help us to take and heed the warning and, and to, Lord, really repent of anything. Lord, that you would point out to us in our lives tonight that needs to change. Help us now in the, uh, uh, and, and open our hearts to receive thy word. Empower the preaching of it. We give you this service, and we thank you for your, uh, for, for your steadfast help and grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You know, the, you read this passage, and it really sounds terrible, you know, but it gets worse. <laughs> Uh, the, the children born to these daughters of Lot became the nations of the Moabites and the Ammonites. And, and though they came uh, from a father who was a saved man, Lot was a saved man. This shows you how bad it can get when a Christian doesn't live for God. I mean, this folks, he didn't get there overnight. Don't make the mistake of thinking, thinking somehow this, he, just, he was just a bad... No, there was a process how this, it got this bad. In Lot's life. But these, the, the, these, these families came from a man who was a saved man. Both of these nations ended up, for, they forsook the true God. Uh, they turned to idolatry, including the worship of Molech and Chemosh and, and, and Baal Peor. I mean, that was, folks, you're talking about false gods. That, that, that There was just all kinds of filthy immorality and, and all manner of vice, even human sacrifice practiced in this pagan worship. And um, it's just, it, they, they became the staunch enemies of Israel, the holy line uh, of Abraham. Yeah, so everything about this just went, went, in, went into the cesspool, didn't it? You know, the idolatry that God destroyed at Sodom and Gomorrah, the idolatry that God judged and destroyed by fire right there, that idolatry lived on in Lot's posterity. Think about that. I mean, here the, what God judged in Sodom and Gomorrah, that same immorality, that same perversity, ended up going on and being actually propagated by the descendants of Lot, the Christian that God rescued out of Sodom and Gomorrah. Wow, that's just... And so generationally, Lot, wow, what a, what a big time failure. I mean, it, it impacted his whole family generationally. I don't think that's what he had planned. I don't think that's what Lot had in mind. I'm sure in all of his dreams and his ambitions and all of his plans, it didn't include the utter destruction of his whole family. I mean, remember, he's lost daughters and sons-in-law in Sodom and Gomorrah. His wife perished as they were fleeing. She turned back and became a pillar of salt. She was in love with Sodom, you know. And then his two remaining daughters that, that are rescued with Lot end up committing this, this, this gross immorality. And, and, and I don't think that's what he had in mind, you know. But... It's not as though he could not see something was wrong with his life. He could see it. The Bible indicates that Lot experienced a great deal of, and the Bible word is vexing. He experienced a great deal of vexing of his spirit every day that he lived in Sodom. In 2 Peter chapter 2 and, and verse 6, the Bible says this, And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, Condemn them with an overthrow. Speaking of God's judgment, Peter is, uh, uh, on Sodom and Gomorrah, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly. And delivered just Lot, meaning he was a just man. That's a description of his, the fact that he's got salvation. He's a believer. And delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked, the, the filthy manner of life of the people of Sodom, every day of his life, 
Lot was vexed by, by, by that. The Bible says in verse 8 there, it says, For that righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing, vexed it. He did it to himself. <laughs> vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. By putting himself in that environment and, and living there because, well, we'll see, he did it because he could make money. He did it because he sought the wealth and the affluence and, the, and, and some notoriety and stuff in, 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 in Sodom. You know, but he vexed his righteous soul every day. The word vexed means to labor down, that is, to wear with toil, to oppress. You know, vexed, um, in verse 8, means to torture. <laughs> you know, pain, toil, torment, toss. I mean, you just get the picture of just, just being ground on by this ungodly environment that, he, that he's put himself into. Lot knew something was wrong with his life. He knew something was wrong with where he was living. He knew uh, that what, there was something wrong with what he was doing. He just didn't want to change anything. <laughs> That's the problem. He didn't want to change it. He, he wanted his life his way. And folks, doesn't that, I'm telling you, that's describing modern American Christians today. Yeah, they, want, they, they don't want to go to hell. They may have very genuinely trusted Christ, but boy, then they seem to hold God out at arm's length. From there on, they don't want God interfering with how they wish to conduct their life and what they want to fill their life with and what they want to pursue in life. And they want to hold God at arm's length while they run their life their way. Well, that's exactly what Lot did. That's exactly what he did. You know, uh, how many have ever done this? I've got to confess, I've done this on occasion. You know in your car, you get in your car, and there's that little yellow light, the check engine light. And, you know, and I'll be honest with you, I mean, sometimes I think, man, I mean, um, it, it, it just, the it'll thing will go off for any number of unknown, crazy reasons. But, you know, I got to thinking about this. You know what that check engine light is like? You know what, hap you know what happens when it goes off, and then you go to the mechanic, oh, yeah, it's just this, and he checks, he, he fixes the code, and it goes away. And then a little while later, it comes back on again, and then you get it fixed again. After a while, that check engine light coming on, it, like, it becomes an irritation, doesn't it? <laughs> check engine light, you know. And, and so, you know and, and, but you know what? I got to thinking about this. The check engine light is kind of like our conscience. See, the, the, the check engine light isn't doing anything to your car. It's just passing judgment on what's already happening in your car. That's what it's doing. It's just alerting you, saying, hey, wait a minute, this isn't good. Check this out. This is not good. That's what the check engine lights tell you. Now, how many people, don't, in fact, don't even raise your hands, but I, this is a rhetorical question. How many people have decided, I am just not going to pay attention to that stupid little yellow light? And drive their car, and you've driven your car for quite some distance with a check engine light still glowing in your dashboard. You know, can I just tell you, to continue the illustration, some Christians do that with their conscience. After they, they want, like Lot, they've got their ideas on what they want to pursue and what they want to chase after that's worldly. It's not, God doesn't have anything to do with it. But they want it, and they're going after that, and the conscience pangs them a little bit, and they get irritated, and they just want, I'm not going to listen to that anymore. And, they st and eventually, you know what? A Christian even can get their conscience seared. You, just, yeah, it's, you quench the Holy Spirit long enough, and pretty soon you can get pretty dull. And a Christian can end up in a place like Lot was, doing things that years ago you'd have never dreamed that Christian would have done. You'd have just never, you'd have never thought it possible. And yet it, their life kept progressing. What were they doing? They just kept ignoring conscience. They kept ignoring the conviction, convicting work of the Holy Spirit of God. They just, no, I'm just, no. 
You know, that's irritating to me. I've got my plans. I know what I want to do. You know? And what's our response when we're smitten in our conscience about something? Do we get irritated at that? Or do we begin to say, Lord, I'm going to repent? I've got to turn from this. You're, you're smiting me about this, Lord. You're convicting me about this, and I need to repent. I turn away from that. See, that's the question. What Lot did was he just kept turning away from that conscience. He kept turning away from that. No, because he had his goal. He had what he wanted to pursue, you know. And, you know, it's not like Lot could plead ignorance or blame it on youth and inexperience either, by the way. I've heard messages before, you probably have too, that kind of give you the impression that, boy, Abraham, Abraham, when he went down to Egypt, man, and he took Lot with him, oh, what a terrible mistake he made. Look at the terrible influence he had over that young man. Uh, actually, Lot wasn't a young man. <laughs> if you examine the scriptures, in fact, look at this. Just look at this really quick. You're going to see that um, um, he was nearly the same age, probably, as, Ab- as Abram was. And um, it may not seem very important because sometimes, you know, we may have been under the mistaken impression that Lot was very young, but it really does matter, and it, and it shows us something. This wasn't an ignorant you know, didn't know any better young man who was still learning some things. No, he's the same age as Abraham. So how do you explain the difference between how they turned out, you know, and and so forth? In in Genesis 11, 26, the Bible says, And Terah lived 70 years and begat Abram, Nahor, and and Haran. Okay, now, those, those are three, they're in that order, but that's not the birth order. Haran was the oldest. Nahor came next. Abram was the last. He was the youngest of those brothers. Um, And I'll explain that in a moment. In verse 28 it says, And Haran died before his father in the land of his nativity in Ur of the Chaldees. Now, Haran is the father of Lot. Okay. Um, And verse 29 says, And Abram and Nahor took them wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Iscah. But Sarai was barren. She had no child. And Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, uh, his son's son. Okay, so, so this is Terah's, Lot is Terah's uh, grandson, and, and he's also um, nephew to Abram. Okay. okay, Abram was his dad's brother. Okay, so this is his uncle. Well, verse 32 says, And the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Now, in chapter 12, verse 1, the Bible says this, Now the Lord said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy thy father's house, unto the land that I will show thee. And then in verse 4, it says, Notice what it says. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him, and Abram was 70 and 5 years old when he departed out of Haran. So when his Father dies, Abram's 75, okay? When, 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 when Terah was 70, he begat Nahor. Now, if you do the math, here's, here's basically, you know, uh, well, let me just give you a sense of the, the background. What we have is apparently Abram had spoken to his father Terah of the true God, okay? And it's, and it's possible Terah may very well have become a believer, um, and, and, and so Abram tells him of God's will to go to Canaan, uh, uh, um, uh, probably sees his father converted, and, and as the head of the family, um, Terah then led, led his family by, they're departing Canaan, or they're, they're departing, uh, excuse me, uh, for Canaan from Ur of the Chaldees, okay? Now, Nahor, the middle son, is not with them, by the way. That just shows not everybody in Abram's family believed on the Lord. Okay. Nahor remained. But Terah came. Must have been, we, we can probably surmise that he believed on the Lord, and, and, and on they go. They made it as far as Haran and stopped there presumably because of, of, uh, of Terah's health and could not go on any further. When Terah died, a- a- Abram resumed the journey to Canaan. Now he's 75 years old at this time. Verse 4 lets us know that uh, he, he, Terah began, he, 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 his first son was born, Haran, when he was 70. 
And then later, sometime between that time and the time he turned 130, Nahor was born. And when he turned 130, that would be 205 minus the 75 years of Abraham. Okay? He's 130 when Abram is born. Now, here's the thing. If, if, if By the time Terah is 130 years old, just follow this. Haran is already 60 years old by the time Abram's born. Haran's probably already marrying and already having kids, amongst whom would be Lot. So 60 years prior to the birth of Abram, uh, of Abram Haran is starting his family. About, and so... I mean, I, I, I mean, uh, and by the, or by the time Abram's born, Haran's probably already started his family and, and is 60 years of age and is starting to, to have his kids, meaning probably about the same time Terah is seeing Abram born in his 130th year, Haran is seeing his kids, including Lot, born. Abram and Lot were about the same age, probably very nearly the same age. By the way, this actually happened. I saw something similar to this. Uh, when growing up, my, we, we had a neighbor, um, our, our next-door neighbors. Uh, their kids were all grown. They'd already finished college, married, started having grandkids for them. And then one day, surprise! <laughs> all of a sudden, Grandma is with child. And they gave birth to a, a young lady, and she was an aunt before she was ever born. <laughs> of multiples. I mean, she had multiple nieces and nephews before she was born. <laughs> so understand, see how this happened? Now, this is one of those things, just a little extra study. You understand, um, Lot isn't some ignorant little teenager or something like this that Abram is dragging off to Egypt with him. No, he's a full-grown man, able to make his own decisions, probably married already by the time they're going from Haran into Egypt. You know, um, the thing about it is, Lot, though a believer, and probably Tara was too, he chose of his own free will to follow his uncle into the land of Canaan. When they got down to Egypt and, and, and all that happened there, he's not some Im impressionable young boy. He's a full-grown, mature adult. Very nearly the same age as, as, as Abram. He's probably well established on his own already. Lot cannot plead youthful ignorance. I'm sure the experience in Egypt didn't do him any good. <laughs> no doubt about that. And he probably got, as flocks and herds developed, and, and, and he, he got more wealth and so forth, something about probably the paganism that was there probably didn't help him at all. But, but Lot really is simply going to start making some wrong choices that are going to lead to all the, the future problems. So what went wrong for Lot and his family? Why did things turn out so differently for him than they did for Abraham? Why is that? You know, why such catastrophic failure for a believer, you know, for a Christian? Three things. And the first one, I'm going to camp here for a little bit because this is the most important. Lot had salvation from God, but he did not have submission to God. That's a problem. See, you can have Bible salvation. You trust Christ and you receive him as Savior. God will save you. But that's not the same thing as submitting your life to God. It's not the same thing. And by the way, just because you got saved doesn't mean you're going to get the same result as someone who gets saved and submits themselves to God and lives for Him and dies to self and just yields themselves to the will of God. You won't get the same result if all you do is just take salvation and then put God at arm's length and say, you know, thank you very much, but i got a better idea on how I want to run my life. That's what Lot said. That's what he did. 
and it didn't work out for him. Lot had salvation from God, but not submission. It's, there's no doubt that Lot was saved. 2 Peter 2, 7, we read it. Um, uh, and delivered just Lot. That's a, that's, a, that's a statement of Lot's personal faith. That's a statement that he was a believer. You know, in verse 8, when it says, for that righteous man, that's a description. That's a description. You can make that description about lost people. That's a specific description of a saved person. Now you say, but Lot was, look at all the sin. Yeah, okay, understand. This is talking positionally <laughs> before the Lord. You know, when we get saved, uh, especially if, you're, if you got saved anywhere later in life and you'd already lived, you know, and you'd, you'd had plenty of sinful baggage in your life or whatever before you got saved, you know what it is to know that, you know, you, you come to Jesus, you receive him as your Savior, and he, he washes your sins away and he saves you. Now the Bible declares you're righteous and you're going, you're looking behind you a little bit, so to speak, and thinking that's a hard thing to almost embrace, you know. I'm righteous? Yeah, in the view of God you are, because it's not your righteousness God is looking at. It is the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ that God is looking at. You got that as a free gift. It cost Christ everything. He took our place. He took our sin. He bore our sin in his body on the tree. He, 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 became, he was made sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That's, that was that great exchange. To, so we, we, we can think something, well, yeah, but there's so many imperfections. Yeah, but as far as God is concerned, all those sins, they're paid for. They're washed away. Now you are clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's why God declares Lot righteous, because he had believed on the true God. He had trusted for salvation. Now, um, uh, Lot was a believer in the true God, but that seems to be where it ends. <laughs> and he just, it's just, it's like he goes that far and then just kind of, urge. that's it. Look at the contrast in Genesis 13 between Abraham and Lot and, and what is particularly emphasized about each of these men. And remember, they're about the same age. Genesis 13, 2. And Abram was very rich in cattle, in silver and in gold, and, and he went on his journeys from the south, even to Bethel, unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Hai, unto the place of the altar, which he had made there at the first, and there Abram called on the name of the Lord. Now notice something about Abram. And, uh, he's also, and, and of course we know his name was later changed to Abraham. So Abraham was different than Lot in this way. Abraham, his way, the, the path that he took in life was determined by his relationship with God. That's what, where he went. What he, the direction he chose. Abraham made some, he made his own mistakes along the way. There's no, there's no indication necessarily that God directed him to go down into Egypt in, in the scriptures. So, you know, uh, theologians will debate that. But, but there's no indication in the Bible that God told him to go down to Egypt. There's a famine coming. No, God's perfectly able to keep us in a famine if, he, if that's necessary. And so that's not a big deal to, to the Lord. But here, Abram, uh, here Abraham is, um, and, and, and what do you see him? He's going, he's going, um, he, he's, he's going to the uh, Bethel where he worshiped the Lord. He's going unto the place of the altar which he had made there at the first. You know, he's got a real relationship with God, and he's letting, his, he's letting God direct his steps. He's letting God order his steps. Steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. <laughs> Abraham's letting that happen. After the near disaster that was Egypt, Abram returns to where the Lord had clearly directed him. Um, and, it, you know, it, 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 it seems like after that, de, kind of the debacle in Egypt, Abram, Abram is just getting back to the place where he last had God's direction in his life. The best of Christians, you know, we can go awry. Okay? We can get off track. Something can come our way. And, 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 but, but here's the difference. That Christian that wants God's leadership is yielded to God and says, I'm going to surrender. That God's Holy Spirit can get a hold of that Christian and bring them back, bring them back to the place. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait. That is not what I have in mind for you. Now get back over here. And they'll follow the leadership of God and they'll say, Lord, forgive me. I repent. I'm going to turn from my way to your way. Okay? And they'll, be just, they'll just get right with, with God again. 
you know, um, and, and that's what Abraham did. You know, he's, he, 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 he wants God's direction in his life. He wants things done God's way. There's no more acting in his own wisdom. Submission to the Lord is his priority, okay? And, you know, um, in, in verse 14, the Bible says this, And the Lord said to Abram, after that lot was separated from him, Lift up uh, now thine eyes and, and look from the place where thou art, northward and southward and eastward and westward. Um, here's another thing. You, know, you see Abram constantly speaking with the Lord, constantly in communion with the Lord. And here's the Lord giving promises uh, to Abram. Abram knew what it was to commune with God in an intimate way. Okay? So we're looking at Abram's life, and we're going to show you Lot's life in comparison. Verse 18, uh, there in, in, in Genesis 13. Um, uh, then Abraham, or then Abram, removed his tent and came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and built there an altar unto the Lord. What do we see Abram doing? When, if he's relocating, he builds an altar to the Lord. He's 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 focused on 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 having a real, intimate, honest to goodness relationship with the true God. You know, God isn't just an, a quick add-on to keep him out of hell. No, he's got a personal relationship with the Lord. It didn't matter where he sojourned. Abram built an altar. He built an altar. Not as a piece of religious decor, but as a statement of his priorities. My relationship to God is my priority. My submission to God is my priority. Letting God run my life and dictate my direction and tell me how to live and give me wisdom and, 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 and letting him call the shots in my life. That's my priority. You know, is it any great surprise that, that Abram was the one to think and react spiritually to the situation that arose between uh, his herdsmen and the herdsmen of, of Lot? There, there this conflict arises. And, and you know, listen, you, you can really tell uh, it's a pretty good thermometer of people's spiritual uh, health, you know, really, to see a Christian and how they respond to a conflict. And here we see it, you know, the Bible says, and Abram said unto Lot, let there be no strife, I pray. This is verse 8. I pray thee between me and thee and, and between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we, are, for we be brethren. You know, so there's, there's Abram. He's, he's got the spiritual wherewithal to say, wait a minute. Listen, I'm not going to let this become a strife between you and me. He's humble. He's got real humility. Well, where does that come from? It comes from a real walk with God. Now, pride, you don't, you, you, don't need to, you don't need to do anything <laughs> to exhibit pride and to be haughty. You just let the flesh run the show, and it'll happen automatically. But in the case of Abraham, he yielded himself to God. Being in submission to God was his priority. And as a result, it showed up in humility in his life. Now, what do we, in contrast, notice about Lot? Here's this guy. It's not his priority to be in submission to God. He's got other goals in life. Genesis 13, 5 said, And Lot also which went with Abram had flocks and herds and tents. And then after the conflict, and Abram is so humble and gracious and all this, you know, um, in verse 10 the Bible says, And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan that was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even, the garden of, even as the garden of the Lord, like the, uh, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest uh, unto Zor. Lot's uh, way was... Uh, his, what he, what, the way he conducted himself in life, his conversation, that's the Bible word for it, the manner of life that he lived, it was driven by what he saw, what he wanted, what he desired, what he lusted after. That's what drove the decision-making for Lot. It wasn't a matter of subjection to God. It's, ooh, look at that. That's what I want. I, I want that. That's for me. You know, that was, that was Lot. That's the way he conducted himself. You know, um, the Bible says in verse 11, then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan. You notice the language there? Lot chose him. God didn't choose that for Lot. There's no consultation with the Lord. Lot chose you know, you look in the scriptures, you never see anything about Lot being in conversation with the Lord. He's never communing with God. He's never praying. He's never looking to the Lord for wisdom. 
He's just looking at what he wants and what he desires, and that's what he's going after. That's his priorities. He's not in subjection to the Lord, so why would he consult with the Lord about what the Lord wants done? Verse 12, Abram uh, dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent towards Sodom. And boy, don't we know that's the beginning of some real troubles. He's going in a direction now that he's chosen because he's not in subjection to God, and we know the outcome. He doesn't know the outcome yet. Let's not get ahead. He, we know the outcome. He doesn't know the outcome, and yet in his mind, I'm sure he's convinced, oh, man, this is it, man. Man, this is going to be such a great blessing in our life. Yes, sirree. This is going to be a great blessing. Oh, man, we're going to, this is going to turn out. You watch. Honey, I can just hear Mrs. Lott. Yes, sir. This is going to, this is going to go great. Oh, man. And, and, of course, she can see the gleam of Sodom off in the distance. Oh, yeah, you know, maybe we ought to move a little closer, honey. You know, and I just say, she was, I think she probably fell in love from a distance with Sodom. But, but Lot saw profit. He saw opportunity. He saw all kinds of things. He just didn't see God in any of it. He never, he never consulted the Lord at all. And the Bible says the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Lot pitched his tent towards Sodom while Abram built an altar to the Lord. What kind of a contrast is that? Just put that in your mind. Oh, man. Money! And then there's Abram over here building an altar, Lord. What do you want? I want to be yielded to you. I want to do things your way. Show, show me what to do. And, of course, we know the promise right after this. Remember the promise that, 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 that God made uh, to, to Abram. He says, I want you to look as far as you can, east, west, north, south. It doesn't make any difference. <laughs> it's all yours. God made a promise to give that all to, to, to Abram. You know, the difference between Abram and Lot is seen in the priority they each gave to their relationship with the Lord. Both were saved. Think about that. They're both believers. But Abram had a daily, intimate, personal relationship with the Lord, and Lot didn't have any time for that. He had no interest, apparently. And that somewhere along the line, he started making one decision and then another and then another. And pretty soon, he's not even consulting with the Lord at all about anything. We have no record of him seeking the Lord at all. Um, Abraham sought the Lord because that was the priority in his life. Be subjected to God. Be yielded to the will of God for my life. That was the priority in his life, but not for Lot. They simply chose differently. That's all. Abram you know, gave the Lord priority in his time and in his decisions and in his belief you know, about the future and, and, and how his needs would be met. You don't, see, you, you don't see Abram at all worried about how he's going to make it. <laughs> you just don't see that. And he's not, he's not looking to, he's not calculating. He, Lot looking at the well-watered plains of the Jordan, you know, he's calculating, isn't he? He might as well have had a calculator. So many cattle, times, so many. Oh, whoa, bonanza, baby. I mean, you could just see it. His eyes got this big with, oh, man, we can really make it the big time down there. And that's what, but that wasn't Abraham's goal. You know? Now, here's an interesting thing. While Lot was driven by his lusts and his. His and everything, uh, notice something about his situation. It had been in Lot's own best interests to be with his uncle for these many years. Lot had really benefited. You know, he was by this time now very well off himself. He had herds, you know, a lot of, he, he had considerable wealth himself by this time. And in large measure, I think, because of the great blessing of God on his uncle uh, Abram. 
But sadly, it is apparent that the wealth and the blessings that he enjoyed because of his uncle's walk with God, those were the real reason that he kept hanging around. See, here's, here's something that happens. Uh, Notice something. We know 1 John 2.15. The Bible says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Okay. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world, and the world passeth away in the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So, you know, the, the, if, you love the, if we're going to love the world and we're going to live for the things of the world, the love of the Father is not in us. Okay. Some Christians make the very same mistake as Lot. Listen, Christians will hang with other Christians. They'll go to church. As long as things are benefiting them, they'll go to church and have Christian friends and hang with other Christians, and so forth. They aren't truly there because they're surrendered to the Lord and they want to walk with Him in a real way. That's not the real reason they're there. They are there only just so long as they are experiencing some sort of personal, worldly benefit for themselves. You say, Pastor, really? People think that way? No, no, understand. They don't think that way. That's the way they behave. Because though they, they, they want to be in church and have everybody think that I'm a Christian, I'm, I'm right with God, and I've got, they want to present the right appearance and image, but while they're presenting that right image, they want to get around that to the things they're really desiring. They want to get around it to the love of the world and the lust of other things and the lust of the flesh. They want to get around that, but they want to maintain the appearance at the same time. You know, and I remember years ago, when still when we lived up in, in Spokane, I, I saw this happen on more than one occasion. You'd have people that would come into churches presenting themselves, oh, we love the Lord, we love the Lord. And what they really were was somebody who belonged to one of the multi-level -mar multi marketing uh, uh, pyramid scheme things, you know. And they were just there to find more customers or find more people that to, to work under them in their building their pyramid. You know what I'm saying? There's, there's all kinds of things like that. And I remember that years ago. I mean, I'm telling you, so these people came across as genuine and, and just, just sincere and all this stuff, and they hung around till being in that church wasn't going to benefit them anymore. And then, doo -doo -doo. And some of them were Christians. I mean, they had genuine testimonies of salvation and stuff. You know, but you let, and there's some Christians that will do that. They're only there just so long as they're experiencing some sort of personal benefit for themselves. But you let their sinful desires and their lusts get challenged, or you let there be some kind of situation arise that might interfere with their pursuit of their own will for their life, and they will find themselves in a vehement disagreement with the very Christians or the very church that has been a source of great blessing in their life. And folks, I've seen this happen time and again. This is exactly what happened with Lot and Abram. He's been, he's been benefiting all this time from his, from his uncle Abraham's walk with God and the blessings of God on him and his wisdom that he has from God. And he's, been, he's benefited, but, but Lot doesn't want anything to do with being in subjection to God. He just wants to get the worldly benefits of all that. You know what that's like in America today? You know what's going on in America today? We're still living on the residual blessings of 150 years ago or more. We're still experiencing in terms of freedom, liberty, even economic blessing, we're experiencing we, the residual. That ain't going to last forever, folks. That's not going to last forever. There's going to come a time, and, and, and what's happening in America is, is the same kind of thing. You know, somewhere along the line, the, 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 the real disagreement between where the Christian is really living and what they're really living for and what happens in a good gospel preaching church, disagreement arises. And I'm no longer feeling the bennies here that I used to experience, so 
Toodaloo. I'm out of here. Because it's not working for me. You know. And that's exactly what happened to Lot. You know, now, as bad as that sounds, <laughs> there's an even worse scenario than that. I want you to imagine an unsaved person who does this. They come to church. You know what? This is a nice place to be. There's a lot of warmth and love. Good fellowship. I mean, we eat good food once a month. I mean, we, <laughs> I mean man, we know how to eat. And we have a good time together. I mean, there's a lot of benefits to being here and uh, being a part of a church family and, and, and so like that. Imagine an unsaved person do this. They adopt... They take on, they're not saved, but they start adopting an outward appearance that looks and acts to a certain degree like saved folk. You know, they, they start packing a Bible in, they start dressing a certain way, they, they, uh, they know the right spots in the service to amen, you know, and, and stuff, and they sing. And and they probably and they bring one of the best casseroles to the to the, to the family of God fellowship. You know, they just get involved, do stuff like that. And yet they're not really genuinely saved. There's no real testimony of salvation, but they're enjoying some of the benefits of being around an atmosphere and an environment like this. And there's real blessings like that. And they do that so long as they get some benefit to themselves that they find enjoyable or useful. And they maintain the outward facade of a born-again believer when in reality they are lost and on their way to hell. They sit in services, they hear the preaching of God's word, and I'm fine, I'm fine, but they don't really know Christ. That happens. You know, Charles Haddon Spurgeon was worried that less than half of the congregation of the Metropolitan Tabernacle was saved. <laughs> it's, you know, great spiritual man, preacher, and he's worried that it is even half of this congregation even saved? You know. Well, here's the problem. Now, to have that person continue in that deceitful little game until one day they go into eternity, did they go to heaven? Did they go to heaven just because they adopted an outward appearance of Christianity in order to benefit themselves in, in some fleshly kind of manner? from, no, they didn't go to heaven. Instead, their outward facade fooled only themselves. That's, that's the danger. You know, um, they end up going to hell eternally having never received Christ uh, um, as Savior. You know, the Christ that they pretended to know. Wow, what a dangerous game it is. To... to want to act like, yeah, I'm a Christian in subjection to God, but really I'm trying to game God. I'm trying to circumvent God. I want the image, I want the appearance, because I want a certain group of people to you know, like me and appreciate me and stuff like that, but I'm going to try to game the system and get my fleshly whatever I want and pursue my own fleshly desires and goals for life. I've got something else in mind, not being in subjection to the true God. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 21, he said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. What's the will of God for you? The will of God is that you would receive his Son. The will of God is that every single lost sinner would bow their knee to Christ and say, Lord Jesus, have mercy on me. Save me. I need you. I can't fix this. I need you. Please, Lord, I turn away from any hope of saving myself. I need you to save me. You know, um, he goes on in that passage saying, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Played the game. You know, lost people can do that. It's a dangerous thing. Save people. Save people can play that same game and end up like Lot, just making total casualties of their whole family, generationally destroying out. So that's point number one. <laughs> okay. 
Lot had salvation. What he didn't have was submission to God. Let me give you just the last two points just very briefly. Lot was blind to the subtle, spoiling influence of worldliness. You know, we don't realize how worldliness deceives and spoils us and ruins us. We, we can, you can be deceived by that. You know, um, when the Bible says in 2 Peter 2, 7 and 8 that he was vexed, that word can mean to, to wear with toil. Eventually, what Lot found, uh, him, found out was that he, it, it, the worldliness that he put himself in and around, it wore him down. It wore him down. Um, uh, he had so deteriorated uh, during his time there in Sodom that he reached a place where he would end up offering his two virgin daughters to a bunch of sex-craved perverts for them to abuse in any manner they wanted to. And, and, and in his mind, it was the right thing to do at the time. And we can look at that and go, that's sick! That is loony. And yet this is a Christian man. That's how blinded, that's how dull in our conscience, that's how we can quench the Holy Spirit of God that much where we'll do things that dumb. You know, that's not a Christian in their right mind at all. And yet he thought he was doing just the right thing. You know, Colossians 2.6 says, As ye have therefore received Jesus Christ the Lord, so walk in him. Okay? You hear that? You received him, what? Because you, there was no other way to be saved. You, you fully trusted in him. Okay, now, walk in him like that. Day by day. Walk in him. Subject yourself to him. The one who died to save you, put yourself in subjection to him for day-to-day -day life. Trust him. You trusted him for your soul. Trust him for this. He says, rooted and built up in him, established in faith, as you have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. Lot's problem was the same as many Christians today. Instead of finding their contentment, their completeness, their fulfillment, their satisfaction, in Jesus Christ, they chase after all the things of the world, not realizing that worldliness will very slowly but surely rob them of everything meaningful. That's what it'll do. That's what it did to Lot. He lost it all. You know. Now the last thing that Lot did, and, and if you go to if you go to Genesis 14, you'll read the account of how the, the kings the 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 uh, the kings uh, the the kings that all banded together and they came in and they and they they captured all of Sodom and Gomorrah and they took them all captive and Lot and his family they were all taken too and but for the grace of Almighty God and his uncle Abram coming to the rescue by the power of God you know uh, he's they're going to be slaves forever but he was rescued now what do you think that circumstance taught Lot? Do you think it grabbed his heart and that, boy, I deserve what happened to me? I just, I tell you what, I need to get right with God. I don't belong here. This is the chastening hand of God trying to deal with me and trying to get my attention. Nope. Didn't happen. When, when, when uh, his worldliness already had him so spiritually dull that when he was being chastened by the Lord, <laughs> he ignored it. That's what happens to Christians today. They can be being chastened by the Lord and, and they can just totally ignore it. What a lost opportunity. Here's the point of this third point. Lot didn't repent when he was chastened. Don't make that same mistake. God pokes your heart about something. Stay soft. Boy, I'd beat a path down the altar, and not just to an affair show of the flesh. Get down here and mean business with God and say, Lord, I'm willing to let you change anything in my life you want to change. I'll turn from my own way, and I'll yield to you. See, Lot just made these terrible, terrible mistakes. 
But the first one and the most important, though he had salvation, he did not have submission to God. He did not subject himself to the will of God. And that, that laid the groundwork for successively poor decisions that got gradually worse and worse and so completely diluted this question that in the end, he, he lost it all. And his own children, <laughs> his own daughters, committed that atrocious sin. They thought that was the right thing to do. Obviously had lots of spiritual instruction, didn't they? That was sarcasm. No. They were completely immersed in the world. Do you know what happens to Christian parents who won't walk with God? Their kids become the world. That's what happens. Because there's no proper spiritual influence there. You know, listen, don't be blind to the subtle spoiling influence of worldliness. If you're, if you're genuinely born again, don't just take salvation and ignore submission to the Lord. Walk in a real intimate relationship with the Lord day by day. I mean, if you're not truly saved, don't try to play games with the Lord. He is not deceived. He will not be mocked. It will cost you eternally to, to try to play a game uh, and, and, and put on a Christian facade without really having the Savior as your Savior. You know, if the Lord's spoken to you about anything, it might, uh, He's spoken to you about anything, don't waste this opportunity. Repent and yield to Him so that He can bless you like He did Abram. And you won't see the cow, you won't see the catastrophe that Lot saw in his life. Let's bow our heads together and let's pray. Father, please help us during this moment of invitation. I pray that you'd